Should college athletes get paid? According to ESPN and On3 valuations, thanks to the new NIL deals, Bronny James was estimated to make $4.9 million. Shadura Sanders was estimated to make $4.7 million. Livy Dunn, $3.9 million. And Caitlin Clark, $3.1 million. Back in 2005, though, Reggie Bush accepted a few hundred thousand dollars in the form of assets, living, food, and travel, and is the first player to be known as an ex-Heisman winner. In 2005, Reggie Bush won the Heisman Trophy, the most prestigious award in all of college football, for his outstanding efforts on the football field. But just five years later, in the middle of his successful NFL career, he was battered with multiple allegations for accepting money to stay at USC. And after a few days in court, USC was also punished with a penalty of over 30 scholarships, which was hundreds of thousands to near millions of dollars for Reggie Bush's acceptance of the money from multiple foundations. Athletes experience short-term risks, long-term risks, and much exploitation from the NCAA, and they should be paid for it. Right now, an athlete's pay is in the form of food, education, and housing, but this is not enough for the risks that they take, short-term and long-term. 10.7 per 1,000 athlete exposures in the NCAA result in injury between the years 2014 and 2019. 38.5% of those, 38.5 injuries per 1,000 at the competitive level result in injuries. And 5.7 per 1,000 exposures at the practice level result in injuries. What an athlete exposure is, is anytime a player steps out on the field for a practice or a game. Many people argue that these numbers are skewed lower than they actually are because of short-term positions like long snappers, kickers, and ball holders who are all counted the same as players who are exposed to 40-plus minutes of the game. The NCAA doesn't offer medical insurance to its players either, which is bad because they're allowed to pull your scholarship for injury at any given point. In the case of Kyle Hadrick, an Oklahoma player who was recruited since the age of 14, it's like he never really attended the school at all. Kyle Hadrick was recruited from his high school in a local town in Oklahoma uh, since he was 14 years of age. And through hard work and dedication, he made it to the school on a full ride scholarship to play basketball. In the fall season, before Kyle could even play a game of basketball, he was guarding a 300-pound player uh, who preferred to remain anonymous, who stepped on his leg and tore his meniscus. At the time, though, the coach told him to go see the trainer, and the trainer told him that it was nothing but a sprain, and that he, through a week or two of physical therapy, he'd be fine. Six months later, in December, his leg was still in much pain, and he decided to go see a real doctor, paid for by his mother. The doctor told him that he tore his meniscus and that it would take months, if not years, of recovery for him to make a full appearance in basketball again. The college cut his scholarship, and he was left out to dry by the college. Flash forward 10 years, and he now works 12-hour shifts at the oil fields in Oklahoma, making not much more money than the average person does. The long-term effects that the athletes face are part-time jobs that they don't get to take in because of their rigorous hours in the sport. The internships that they don't get to accept because of their rigorous hours in the sport. The connections that they don't get to experience and the resume that they don't get to really fulfill because of how much time they spend on the sport. College athletes spend on average, well, college athletes are supposed to spend no more than 20 hours per week for their sport, but 
the NCAA conducted studies of its own that said that thir most athletes participate in at least 30 hours of a sport, and it's not uncommon for an athlete to participate in 40 hours of a sport per week. This gives them no time on top of school to do any of these things, which leads to lower pay when the 90% of them don't get to compete at a pro level and less higher ability because of their poor resume. Athletes are completely overworked in the NCAA. On average, baseball players work 42.1 hours per week, men's basketball 39.2, football 33.3, football 41.6, and other men's sports 32.0. These studies were conducted by the NCAA themselves, and none of the colleges who the studies were conducted from face any punishment for it, even though that they're supposed to work only 20 hours per week at most. And of the $18.8 .8 billion they make, 11% 11 11 of it goes to game travel, 17 to facilities, 19 to student athletics aid, and a whopping 19 to the coaches, and 1% to medical. The remaining 2% goes to recruiting, and the remaining 40% goes to other finances that the NCAA does not disclose. This just goes to show that the NCAA makes more than enough money to finance paying their players, an equal share of the money that they take in. Some of the largest earners of this year were the Big Ten, the SEC, and the Pac-12. The Big Ten brought in $489 million in 2022 revenue. This is more than the Tennessee Titans and the Houston Texans brought in that year, which is much more than enough to pay their players. My work cited.